Welcome to the Confluence Cast presented by Columbus Underground. We are a weekly Columbus centric podcast focusing on the civics, lifestyle, entertainment, and people of our city. I'm your host, Tim Fulton. This week, there is often a complex interplay between preservation and progress. A year into his exploration, Columbus Underground reporter Jesse Bethay continues to sift through the story of how the removal of remains from what was once the North Market parking lot unfolded. From the contentious removal of centuries-old graves to the forensic analysis of unearthed remains, today's episode navigates the ethical, legal, and emotional complexities surrounding the issue. In the quest to honor the past while embracing the future, we examine what lies beneath the surface of urban development and confront the ghosts of history that still shape our city today. You can get more information on what we discussed today in the show notes for this episode at theconfluencecast.com. Enjoy the interview. Sitting down here with Jesse Bethay, Columbus Underground freelance journalist. Jesse, how are you? I'm great. Good. Last time we talked, we talked about the series of articles that you had done on the North Market graveyard, the graveyard that was discovered in basically the parking lot of the North Market, just north of downtown Columbus, just south of the short north. Uh, There's been some development since then. Basically, I wanted to check in. I do also, at the beginning of this podcast, kind of want to give you a lot of credit for inspiring me and I think our listeners a little bit to think about Columbus in a slightly different way, to think of it as a place that maybe we haven't taken as much ownership over as we maybe should. Um, So I wanted to give you that credit there. Well, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Do you feel the same way about this story? I, I think because you are running it down. Like, let's be clear. I I definitely think the same way. Okay. Um, And I, let me put it like this. Okay. I see people sort of cheerleading Columbus and I see people degrading Columbus, you know, and sort of back and forth all the time. And the place where they never seem to meet is the idea that Columbus has any sort of history. The people that degrade Columbus are sort of like, we have no culture. We have no history. Mm-hmm. We have, we didn't come from anywhere. It's you know, this place is just sort of, and in a sort of subtler way on the side of people cheerleading and, and always wanting the newest thing, they sort of do that without thinking, what are we losing when we chase after the newest thing? Um, Well, well, and maybe I would frame their cheerleading sort of in the, we have this great opportunity to build. Right. And it's like, yeah, that's that there's nothing wrong with that, but building upon what, Mm -hmm. right. Which I think metaphorically, this story is that right. One great example of that, and this is far afield, and yeah. sort of, so feel free to cut it out. But there's the um, there's the plaque at Coleman's Point, okay, um, on the Sayada River, and uh, it has a picture of Michael Coleman, and it has his famous quote that the city that stays the same gets left behind, and it's beautiful. It's a great sentiment, but every time I I think about it, or every time I walk by it, I'm like, I wonder if that's going to get torn down one day to build something else. <laughs> Okay. You know, and that would be a, you know, in a way that that sort of uh, would be following his mantra, his edict. Right. But it also, you know, he too is a part of Columbus history. And and how would we who remember that part of Columbus history feel if it was destroyed? Right. Um, And in the same way, I think that erasing the North, the North graveyard. Yeah. Which it is what's happening. I mean, it's already been mostly erased by it was what's paved there. over to sure. start right yeah, so it's not and that's another thing it's not as if this development is erasing it it's mm-hmm. already been erased right so let's step back a little bit sure. for those that have not uh didn't hear the first podcast yeah, i invite you to, to do it but what's the high level uh story here okay this is a speed run okay uh in the early 1800s right as columbus was founded a plot of land was picked to be the city cemetery. Every city needs one. You know, yep. people are always dying. Yep. So that's where they started burying people, and they kept burying people there until about the Civil War. And to be clear, this is the location right behind where the North Market currently sits. Yes. Got it. Just to give people some dimensions, it yeah. would be like 
the land below Spruce, above uh, Convention Center Drive, mm -hmm. and between Park Street and High Street. Okay. So it was right on High Street. It was this sort of uh, trapezoidal shape. Mm -hmm. And it was quite large. There's uh, a reason why Char Bar in the basement is so creepy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah this is, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, that, it was right perfectly there. Yeah. Um, so about 1864, it was too full. It was decrepit. Tombstones were falling down. And so the city decided we're not allowing people to be buried there anymore. A few years after that, they said, this is a really good piece, piece of, of land. land. Yep. Right. And we're going to start, we're going to start selling off pieces of this to developers that want to build, you know, railroads. They want to build taverns, saloons, whatever. And was it your first article named come get your dead? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so as part of this effort, they were like, obviously we're not going to, build these buildings on top of people uh, if you have it and they would put articles in the newspapers mm -hmm. that would say if you have anyone buried in the north graveyard please come get your dead yeah. more or less um now obviously what that depended on was that people saw that in the newspaper right or could still read. could could Let read in the valid. 1870s right um and that they still lived here mm -hmm. and if none of those things were true then you had a bunch of people still buried under North graveyard that nobody knew they were there. And so they dug up all the people they could, mm -hmm. all the people they could find and uh, said, well, that's it. And so then the word was the graveyards cleared and we can build whatever we want. On top and of do this. you believe at that time and forgive me, I don't remember this. Do you believe at that time that they thought there's no more bodies here? I think that, from then on, mm -hmm. for the next 150 years, there was a lot of wishful thinking. Okay. I think that, you know, there are all of these stories from between that time and now saying, oh, yeah, we were dig digging a telegraph line or a telephone line and we found a skull or, you know, we were building this and we found some bones. But I think there was always the overarching wishful thinking was... Well, we got most of it. There's going to be a few, but we, we got these were one offs. These, this was not a right. thing right? because there was no real way to know until you did a comprehensive archaeological excavation. Right. Which is what which is what, what we just did. You, and we did that kind of like that wasn't the point of it. Right. The point of it was we're going to put this new tower behind the North Market, mm -hmm. uh, which as we speak here on Leap Day 2024, they're laying the foundation like they're done digging yeah so fast forward at least a little bit in terms of your narrative there was some obfuscating at that time when we talked about like well who's in charge of this and who's frankly whose f responsibility is this uh there were tents oh that were covering up uh, the site of remains mm -hmm. on in the parking lot. It did indeed delay the construction of the North Market Tower, um, but I think you found some additional things as well. Like what? Because I think originally the final resting place place was meant to be Green Lawn Cemetery. Yes. Is that still true? It is. Okay. But and this is kind of where the wish wishful thinking of it all felt. You know, kind of collapsed. Oh, okay is uh, Tara Rose Cassano, who's one of the, the scientists working for Lahana and Associates. She was one of the people responsible for, for excavating these, okay. um, these remains. Uh, she actually said to city council, I think in July of last year, she okay. said something to the effect of, we thought we were going to discover you know, 200 mostly empty graves, and we discovered many multiples more. So oh. hundreds of more. Sorry. Um, Let's dangling modifier there. Yeah. Hundreds of more <laughs> graves, but empty. I, it's been very hard for me to discern that. Okay, um, I've heard. Sorry, I'm going to ask for another clarifying no, question. No, no, that's fine. There are a lot of graves. There are a lot of graves. More graves than anyone thought. More, yes, there are. At, Remain, but remains were found. Yes, and more remains than anyone thought would still be there. And do we have a concept of how many? people maybe because you showed me a map even at one point that was like well that looks like a grave but see how it's constructed that means that that's a, a site of graves mm -hmm. plural and some of the graves are on top of each other right exactly so that's what i mean that, right. yeah there's there's cross-cutting graves as well okay 
So it is very hard to pin down a specific number. Okay. Uh, the last time I talked to Tara Rose, she she sort of said, you know, if I tell you a number now, it could be different tomorrow. Because okay. Because they're taking a jumble of bones, more or less, and they're sorting out into individual people that those bones belong to. Because there's not going to be three femurs. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. Um, and that process takes time. It could take, take years. Okay. So I've heard estimates in the high 900s. Um, but I'm not, it, it's, Sorry. it's very fluid of individuals remains. Yes. Of, of individual people. The remains are even, you know, and so, uh, <laughs> sorry, I know <laughs> that's a, sorry. That's a bit of a lot to take. That's a lot to take in. Um, but translating that back maybe a little bit, sure. it's in, also entirely possible. Hey, you came and got your, the remains for your family mm -hmm. and that excavation may not have been as thorough and proper as I think everyone would hope right. would happen. I would say that's extremely likely Okay, um, in many cases. Okay. Uh, and so I think it's when all is said and done and all the remains are reburied at Green Lawn, uh -huh. um, very good chance there'll be people buried in multiple different spots Got at it. Green Lawn okay. be because of what you just described, that they did such a slapdash job in the 1800s. Because they didn't have... Well, and there may even be people in Green Lawn that are in Green Lawn that another, quote-unquote, part of them is now about to be reinterred. Yeah, that's, that's exactly... Yeah. Okay. Okay. So so let's... But, go ahead. Well, just to answer your original question, because yeah. they will be buried at Green Lawn, but there was a specific section in Green Lawn that was established in the 1800s for people who were being moved out of North Graveyard. Okay. They found... Sorry, and <laughs> this conversation is going to be like this. That's okay. Uh, let's say remains were not gathered by family or ne next of kin, however you want to refer to them. Sure. The city, it was believed that there was an attempt to migrate those bodies, even if they were unclaimed. Yes. Okay. But it depended entirely on, because a lot of the gravestones were missing at okay. by that time, or not, it was not well taken care of or documented apparently it was yeah and okay. uh it, it depended entirely on sort of institutional memory of the people who of the caretakers mm -hmm. at, at the graveyard to remember where people were buried okay um <laughs> so back to greenland sorry there was a plot there was a plot specifically designated um and that is where uh back in the early 2000s they did an excavation along spruce street and that's where those remains were buried okay um, that's sort of the section for people who were buried in North Grave, um, North Graveyard. Mm -hmm. uh, they found in this last round of excavations in 2023, they found too many bones. Um, okay. And so they've actually chosen a new plot at Green oh. Lawn uh, that will be where these folks go. Okay. And so that's going to... I don't know where the plans sit now. Last time I talked to Randy Rogers, who is... Um, in charge of the Green Lawn Cemetery Association. Okay. He was saying they were going to pick, they were going to build a new memorial there mm -hmm. um, for, you know, for these people, uh, because obviously they're not going to be able, we're not going to be able to identify most of them. Right. Uh, it's at least it's extremely unlikely. Yeah. Um, and we, there's. So what, talk to me about how, because I, <laughs> it's fascinating to me that you're so ingrained in this one very, feels specific, but speaks to so, many different things yeah right? and some sometimes and this is why i'm depending on you because i get i'm i'm in the weeds on this so yeah <laughs> well yeah because i because and that's why i'm stopping you right sure, yeah, because you. you are so deep in a story like this that it's like oh yeah yeah i gotta tell you about this part of it right like it's like telling somebody like you know why'd that marriage end or why'd you break up? It's like, well, we had to fight about this. That seems pretty dumb. Sometimes, yeah. But if you consider the context, sometimes it's like, right. This is a dream I had last night. You yes. Know? It's, and, and there's a <laughs> lot to it. So when remains are discovered, a collection of remains, which I would hope is a fairly rare occurrence, there is a proper way to inter them, mm -hmm. bury them, you don't just put them all into one thing if you uh, can avoid it. You have to make a reasonable effort to sort of separate them as a as a remains. Yes. Take what have you learned about that? Like, how are they handling that? So, um, what I was told by Mary Ellen O'Shaughnessy, who is sort of 
taken on the funerary aspects of all of this. Okay. Her intention is to, once they have done all the analysis, and again, this is going to be a years long process for okay. them to do the, the osteological analysis of, of the bones. Osteo means bones. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and have them separated into individuals and saying like, these are all the bones that we can find of this individual. Right. Um, some of that's going to be easier because a lot of them were articulated. They were fully sort of okay skeletons. Um, so those are going to be easier to, to separate into right. individuals. Once they're separated out, they're each going to be put into their own individual boxes, not a full casket, but a okay. small box. Yeah. Those boxes are going to fit into human sized caskets. Okay. Um, and then they're going to be buried in a vault. Okay. And then the vault is going to be under the ground in, in green lawn. Okay. So it's sort of like a, it's a bit of a Tetris situation. They're going to be putting boxes within boxes. Okay. But, it, but respectfully stored yes, yes. is really the be, way to sort of think about it. Right. And they're okay. going to be separated. And, and one of the reasons is it's... It brings... I don't... I don't... I have all due respect for human remains, right? But it sounds a little bit like almost a filing system of like, hey, we know that this is this. And so we're going to put it in this enclosed thing, which mm -hmm. may then be... You know, and then the next one we discovered is right next to it, and it's got its number or ca catalog associated yeah. reference to it. it. It definitely it does feel clinical, but there's a way of looking at it and saying like, that's almost the best you can do. Yeah, because there's well, no way to identify, rather, right? Yeah. yeah, and you're the reason they're going to be sent to Greenlawn is because the because again, the remains previously that were moved out of North graveyard ended up there. Right. So presumably they would be buried in the same cemetery as their friends and family, or at least folks who were around at the same time. Right. Contemporaries. Right. right. Which is, you know, again, as close as you can get without having any identification. And from an archeological standpoint, we should say that they were, the, it was not a bulldozer that like went through and got all these remains. As soon as they found remains, actual construction and like digging stopped. And there were pro are they are they archaeologists? They, is that what you would call them? Yes. So they are. Um, <laughs> this is an interesting distinction. Okay. But they are what's called CM CRM archaeologists. That's cultural resources management. Okay. So they are archaeological contractors that people hire when they are going to be operating in a location that they know has, you know, human remains or archaeological. You know, it'd be the same as if they were okay. working at a site that was known to be like a native site got um, it okay now it is it, it wasn't so much like we just start digging in and stop if we hit bones because they were aware i mean everyone knew this spot was this is gonna when we do this yeah and everybody yeah well and what was interesting to me at the time is i felt like I knew that mm -hmm. like, and then when the story came out and everybody was like, what the fuck? And I was like, we knew that like we knew and, but it, in it's hindsight, funny. what you realize is like, yeah, we knew it, but we don't talk about that. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, and it, it, it it's funny that like I've done 11 of these stories yeah. and the comments are always sort of like, what? Yeah. Like, <laughs> right. Uh, okay. I'm happy you're learning this, but yeah, I don't know what else we need to tell you. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I think that, and that, but I think that's an, a, a symptom of this sort of thing we have about Columbus of like, yeah, there wasn't a Columbus before 1989. What are you talking about? How could there be a graveyard under North market? You know? Right. <laughs> City center was our founding. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and so, yeah, I can understand why it's such a surprise. I actually, I had a really great conversation with Bucky uh, Cutright. He's yeah. the, the person who runs the ghost tours. Yeah. And he was saying like, yeah, you know, it's annoying but it's good for business because I'm always surprising people. <laughs> fair. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. So fast forward a little bit. Uh, the, and we've covered the, it was an archeological dig. They, so as they were very, they did this in a proper way mm -hmm. when remains were discovered, uh, where are the, so, and now they're going through the process of basically separating out, the remains, yes. which may be a very long process. And not just separating, but they're going to try and determine age. Okay. Of, you know, how old. When, uh, sorry. Yeah. 
Because I don't mean, I mean both age of the person when they died and also how old the okay, bones are. Okay, so both those yeah. factors. Um, they're trying to determine gender where they can. They're trying to determine ethnicity where they can. Okay. Determine race where they can. And then also determine um, pathologies. So if there are any obvious injuries that you can look at and be like, well, this person has a... A broken axe shaped right. hole in their skull. So okay. I think I know how they died, you know, and, and so that sort of thing, trying to determine how, how the people died to the extent that they can. Basically any information they can glean from the bones and the, you know, if there was any clothing or artifacts they were buried with. Okay. They didn't get a lot of that, but there, there are some things they discovered, uh, artifact wise that might, um, that might help give an idea of how old they are. Uh, where they came from, you know, if it's like, hey, this button was only made in Germany or whatever. Okay. Um, or this button And only was... made at a certain time. Exactly. Right. Or this button is, you know, expensive. You know, this, okay. this must have been a wealthy person. You know, okay. That, that sort of thing. And, and the same with like, uh, you know, if their teeth are worn down, that might give you an idea of their hmm. economic status. And uh, so will there be... What would be done with that, right? Is that the kind of thing that like someone like you as a journalist would like write you know write the th third third of your book yeah. about like here's the people that were there yeah that would be compiled into a report okay that would be given to uh, it would be a public report right um it would be one imagines quite lengthy because yeah. they found a lot of of people and a lot of things yeah um, and it's gonna take a long time for them to write it so okay I'm hopefully the book comes out first. <laughs> <laughs> so, can, and but. we had been talking a little bit about sort of the, the folks who are doing that work has changed over time. Yeah. Is that before we get too far into it, should we read anything into that? Or is that just sort of administrative state people, this person started the job and this person finished it. And so, I mean, that set that aside or what, why did that happen? That stuff happens. I, um, I've, I've heard a lot of different reasons for why the osteological analysis um, leadership has sort of shifted okay, and, and kind of different reasons from different sources. So yeah. I don't really want to speculate too much on that. Of course. But I think in general, uh, there, there, there's a striving for efficiency, um, mm. uh, for accuracy, obviously. But this is part of, you know, they're doing the, this is a job. They're, mm -hmm. Lahana and Associates are doing a job for their client, which is Rockbridge, the company that's that's building the Merchant Tower, and right. so they're trying to get they're trying to do a good job, but also a speedy job, you right? Know, within reason, they're, they're, so I think that, that well, that's does part that of it. study to, doesn't sort of hold up? Well, sorry, now that I say that, I know why, right? It costs more. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It certainly does. So that that has sort of changed hands a little bit. Sure. Um, is there, but. I guess what I'm trying to ask is, is that even important to talk about? Cause we have another kind of juicy thing that you uncovered. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not, um, it's and not that's fine. No, 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 it's not unimportant. It's okay. just, uh, it's still very much in the infancy. Okay. You know, it's, I think it's just going to take a long time okay. to do this to even, even when I say trying to do it speedily, mm -hmm. That that's a relative term, you know, right. like you could, you could send all of them to like a DNA lab to mm -hmm. see what, what DNA you can extract. And that's, we'll talk about that later when we okay. talk about cholera, but that's, that costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. And so maybe you decide it, maybe it's worth it to some, you know, to do it for a sampling of the bones, but not all of them. Right. Um, and in fact, it, it might be that they do a sampling of the bones to do the, the gender, the race, and the, the ethnicity. Again, picking the most articulated ones, the ones that you have the most okay. remains for, and saying, "Okay, let's just focus on these." And is that the smart way to do it? Because it's, like it's, it feels like it's sampling, right? It's mm -hmm. like polling. Sure. Like uh, intelligent people will know we take a census, which is literally we're going to do every single thing, mm -hmm. and with with the basically amount of things they need to process. Frankly, I don't believe there's any finite time we need to do it. But like, yeah, maybe we do a sampling. And this is, I think, what I'm advocating for. Do a sampling, get a good idea of what we're looking at and what, you know, do an Occam's razor. Like, oh, these are horses and not zebras. Mm -hmm. And then continue the work of categorizing these people and, you know. So the, 
the typical way of doing it, mm -hmm. I, I believe the typical way of doing it is doing the sampling based on the remains that you have a fuller picture of. Okay. Um, they're definitely going to photograph and catalog all of the remains they discovered. Okay. But like you were saying, if you're having, if you just have a femur that doesn't belong to any other skeleton and you're like, well, this is, this is clearly represents one individual. Right. We just don't have the rest of them. There's really not more information you can get from that other than this is a femur and maybe it has a, an injury or something. Right. But, and we can maybe figure out how old it is. Um, but comparing that to, we also have this articulated skeleton or we have, you know, how, you know, however, however many, many they have right. that are fully articulated, you're going to be like, let's just, let's focus on those because we can get so much data out of that. And there's that. so much more information, right. right? So what other, you would reference other testing that they're doing? Well, one thing I'll, I'll say is that they are, Wahan and Associates, at least when they were excavating, seem to be much more, they seem to be more thorough than they necessarily needed to be. Hmm. Um, and in particular, one of the ways is doing the, what's called photogrammetry. Okay. Um, that's basically, they, they took, you know, several dozen different photographs of each grave. Okay. And from those photographs build a high resolution 3d model okay. of what, of what was in there. They did that for every single grave, which is unusual. Okay. Usually you wouldn't do that. And usually you wouldn't do it for empty graves, but they, they did it for the empty ones too. Hmm. If they found a grave, they were like, this was clearly a grave. But they dug down six feet and there was nothing there. No remains, no artifacts, no anything. They still did the photogrammetry of the empty grave huh. so that they had that data as well. So they were very thorough in that regard. Okay. And so that is also going to be a very fascinating part of the report when it comes out. Because that will tell us both where the grave sites were, but also I imagine where they may have, what did you refer to it when uh, one grave was cross cutting? Like, yeah. Cross when they had the graves like mm -hmm. that's, that will show that. And it, and this is me speculating, but okay. I imagine it will also show a very clear dichotomy between articulated skeletons, mm. which all, all of which were buried with evidence. According to Lahana associates, every articulated skeleton was buried, was buried with evidence of a previous coffin. So they were clearly, mm. you know, okay. they were buried in a container of some sort. Um, so it'll show a clear dichotomy between those and the sort of jumbles the, of the jumbles, sorry, jumbles of bones and, oh, look, there's no coffin here. Yeah. yeah which could mean, an, it doesn't necessarily mean they were buried with that one, but it could mean, so this is clearly evidence of there was a grave here. There was a coffin here. There was a articulated skeleton. The coffin was exhumed. The, the mm. skeleton was moved. But all maybe these, they didn't do a good job. Yeah, but all these bones were left behind. And also probably, but also, I'm not a, I don't know enough about these things, but uh, is also possibly evidence that like, this was the poor side of the graveyard. Sure. This yeah. is where the not, maybe, maybe they were coffins, but they're not as nice. Or, and historically, we know that there, that was the case, that there was a, uh, there was a potter's field okay. um, situation uh, because it was the city cemetery. This, this right. is where if you died in Columbus between 1813 and 1864, that's where you were buried. Yeah. And sorry, especially if you, uh, you couldn't afford to be buried elsewhere. Additionally, is it evidence that like maybe this area was less disturbed than another in the development that happened after that? when that land started being developed. Well, I think the, the premise is that all of the, because they only dug under the, the parking lot and right. the parking lot area has been undisturbed, you know, at least under the ground. Like there was never, a, there okay. were, they, they did find foundations of like the previous North market. Okay. Um, and, and the Quonset hut. Mm -hmm. Um, but overall compared to the rest of that area, this sort of square where the parking lot was, was fairly undisturbed okay. under the soil. And so, Again, relatively. Right. And so I think no matter what the expectation is, there wouldn't have been okay. very much disturbance. What other testing in addition to? So one of the things they did was they did soil samples. Hmm. Um, and s they were looking for a number of things. But one of the things I know they were looking for specifically is they, this, I had a great conversation with uh, an Italian uh, archaeologist named Giuseppe Virtualati. And okay. he, uh, he was an advisor early on the excavations as a doing the photogrammetry. Okay. Um, because he did very similar work at a place called the Harrison township cholera cemetery down in Lockbourne. Okay. Which is contemporary with North market. So the people that were buried there roughly around the same mm. time as the people buried at North, North graveyard. Okay. 
Um, but his specialty is is uh, bioarchaeology um, and specifically chase, you know chasing cholera cemeteries. He mm. studied cholera cemeteries in the U.S. He studied them in Italy. Okay, um, and so and he did these soil samples at Harrison Township and Tara Rose Cassano, who I mentioned earlier, was working there as well. Okay. And so when she was hired, you know, there's, there's a lot of overlap between these two, partially just because there's not that many archaeologists in right. central Ohio. Okay. But there's a lot of overlap between these two projects. And so they continued this system of doing soil samples. Um, the process would have been to do samples at the, the head of a grave. Okay. Um, the sort of Mids, stomach area, right? groin area, and then the feet. Okay. The, the reason to do it, the feet is more of a control because you'd not expect any cholera DNA there. Okay. Um, but you would expect it expelling from the orifices of a person recently okay. deceased. And so, yeah, that, that, the, the point of that is to try and identify cholera DNA um, because we know that it was very prevalent around that time. We know historically that people who died of cholera in Columbus during the two major cholera pandemics, that was 1833 and 1849. Okay. Uh, a lot of those people were, would have been buried in, in North graveyard. Okay. The problem, and, sorry, and sorry, is knowing that simply, Oh, we know how this person died or is it additional? Like, well, is it that about that individual person or is it more for the historical record of oh more people died of cholera than we were aware of in columbus or is there some significant like oh we can identify this strain that happened in 1833 is it is it for modern use and purposes so there's a couple of reasons why that would be significant one of okay. them would be you know if this is unlikely but if we were like oh you know this person died of cholera historically we know that and so maybe this is, maybe we can identify them based on that, but that I, that's crazy okay. unlikely. The second reason is for the historical record to establish, to, to get an idea of how people with cholera were treated after they were deceased in the U S okay. and there's a lot of, it's interesting because there's a lot of myths about cholera epidemics, a lot of stories about like mass graves okay. and people being tossed into to pits and forgotten about. And Dr. Vercellati said a lot of that is is sort of false. It was, you know, it, he sort of compared it to a mass grave makes sense in a situation like a genocide, right. where the people doing the burying hate the people being buried. Right. But in a in a pandemic situation, you're being buried by your loved ones. Still. There's still they, they, an acknowledgement. Right. Right. So. so and he said that there were, that did happen sometimes in European countries where the the scale of death was just so much. Um, that those cholera there cemeteries... There was not an option. Yeah, so right. those cholera cemeteries look very different from the ones he studied in the U.S. Got it. The third significant thing uh, is if they found cholera DNA at North Graveyard, that would be the first time anyone's ever found cholera DNA in a grave site. Um, what? They've never, they've never been able to find it, even in graves that they know are cholera graves. Okay. Um, so we're looking for something we've been in the past trying to find. Yes. Got it. Dr. Vercellati says he, he did, you know, these samples at, at Harrison Township, where, again, he knows these were people who died of cholera and were buried. He found DNA of, of other pathogens, just general human DNA, okay. um, which, of course, they, they could easily find from, from North Graveyard as well. Uh, but he never found cholera. And he's but been isn't, this, isn't that a theory that you would be able to? You, if he's never found it. Yeah. Right. He, it, it is a theory that you would be able to find it. Theoretically, you should be able to find it. But if he did find it... If he did find it, that would be the first time... We're putting Columbus on the map. <laughs> His theory is that cholera being... I don't know how much you know about cholera. I Not a lot. I unfortunately had to read a lot about it to write that, okay. that story. But um, it just flushes out your system. Man. Okay. That's how and you, it's bad. It's one, it's bad. And two, it's gross. Yeah. Like it's a it's, bad, gross disease. You're, you're, you die of diarrhea essentially. Okay. And from dehydration due to, to uncontrollable diarrhea. Okay. And so the, th his theory is if a person is dying that way, mm -hmm. they're flushing all of basically everything out of their system and there's no cholera left when they're buried. Hmm. So he he was saying, well, or even maybe the like the 
embalming or internment process, like it would just wouldn't be there. Right, because you would, you would expect that one of the things, well, one, your family members wouldn't bury you with soiled clothing, for right. example. Um, two, your family members may very well clean you before, right. which obviously you would want, right? Yeah, but would possibly spread the disease the right. bacteria. So that, that okay. is also dangerous. Um, but there's, so there's all sorts of reasons why they wouldn't find it. But if they found it, that'd be pretty, pretty exciting. In yeah. A way, you know, for, Indeed. from a bioarchaeological point of view. And so the testing aside, mm-hmm. uh, as you've continued to sort of research this, I think that you've also done a good job of taking a, a higher level view that is, not only, okay, this happened, how, how was it addressed, but also sort of saying, like, how did, peop- how did the, the people that we entrust with handling these things address it? You actually did a FOIA request both with uh, the city of Columbus mm-hmm. and with the state agency that's empowered to address these. What's the agency? The State Sorry. Historic Preservation Office, yes. The state Historic Preservation Office. Uh, both of them responded to your request uh, in, in slightly different ways. Yes. Um, t- tell us about that first. Cause I think it's interesting. So I, I sent a FOIA request to the city of Columbus mm-hmm. and they responded pretty well and pretty quickly. Uh, Matt Lorenz in particular, uh, he I've worked with, I interviewed him and, and have worked with him mm-hmm. you know, a couple of times on this story. And he sort of compiled all the emails that he had available, um, during the the process specifically of the 2022 excavations because that okay. was what the city was involved in okay uh they didn't really have much involvement with the big excavations in 23 okay but he sent sort of a folder full of of stuff uh that i could look through and and then i i sent a similar request to shippo to the state historic preservation office and got a different response okay. um, i was told that be- Shippo is underneath the Ohio History Connection, mm-hmm. and uh, so they told me they are technically a nonprofit, and not a state agency, uh, even though which is sort of true. I mean, they are an independent organization that is funded by the state. Yeah, uh, and they're the the Shippo, you know, state historic preservation officer is appointed by the governor. So okay, it's, it's definitely some. It's it's uh, more of a gray area than I think. Yes, um, but they did. I think what they did is they said, "Here are the emails." By the way, we don't have to give these. To it was you. yeah. That right. was the gist of it. It okay. was they 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 said, you know, we want to be helpful. Yeah, here's everything we have, but we also don't have to give this to you. And so, what did you find there? Um, I found a really good, candid look at sort of the interactions between each of the different. I would say entities because mm-hmm. it's not just agencies, it's, you know, private companies, contractors, yeah. you know, all the different entities involved in this, uh, sending emails back and forth, just trying to get on the same page for years okay. uh, in advance of, of the beginning of excavations in 2022. Um, you know, and did you ask for everything about the, like the merchant building in general, or was it like, Hey, anything of just about the excavation? Yeah. I specifically, because I, I also knew that like, any interactions that like Lahan and associates had with Rockbridge, like I don't have access to those, the, they're public those, or they're, they're private companies. They right. don't have any responsibility to, to give that to right. the media. Um, but anything that involved the city or state mm-hmm. to an extent, um, mm-hmm. you know, is, <laughs> is more public. And, and, and so that's what I had access to. Uh, so I was sort of looking at it from the perspective of Matt Lorenz and from Krista Horrocks. And from those two perspectives, I really got an idea of sort of like who was who was talking to each other, who okay. was not talking to each other, and who like and kind of what the pitfalls were okay. here and there. Uh, one incident in particular, like right after they started excavations in in 2022, mm-hmm. um, the city had AEP out there uh, on Park Street doing complete like. It wasn't unrelated in the sense that it was. They were uh, doing utility work, right? Though. They were right. doing utility work, and it was for the merchant building. But apparently, nobody really thought that 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 was that they had to have that as part of the calculus because okay. the story that I got from the emails that uh, of Krista Horrocks yeah. is that they were out there and 
they started their work and some of the guys from Lahana Associates came over to them and said, Hey, what, what are you doing? Do you know about the, the graveyard? Do you know there's bodies there? Right. And the, <laughs> and the contractors are saying there's, this is a cemetery. We should probably stop and, right. you know, see what's going And so, and so Krista Horrocks is learning this and saying like, this is bad. This is someone who dropped the ball here, you know? Right. We need to, and so you, you get the sense that Shippo determined that they had no authority to oversee any of this because it didn't trigger any of the laws that they are concerned with. Okay. Um, but so who's the, so it's a city issue. It's 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 complicated. Okay. There are three major. You can cut some of this out if it gets I, too. Well, I'm interested. Okay. In well, it, so. so there's three major laws: two uh, state, one federal. The federal law is Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation, Preservation Act. Act. Yes, that's yeah. Um, and that's uh, that really imp- stresses any federal agency doing anything. Um, that might impact a cemetery uh, has to be coordinating with the state shippo. Okay. Every state has a shippo. Got it. Um, Which makes it all the more a publicly reportable entity. One would but, think, yes. But yeah, you can say it's no little, to yeah. my FOIA request. Sure. Um, shippo determined that didn't count or didn't apply here because no federal agency was involved. Okay. So box checked. Right. Not our, so not our problem. Good. Oh, two state laws. Yeah. Ohio revised code 149 point something. I can't quite Good remember. Good job though. Like, well, I think it's 149.07. Okay. Yeah. I'll check um, you on that. <laughs> I'll fact check the end of this episode. <laughs> so it, it's basically the same thing except with state agencies. Any state uh, entity that's doing anything that okay. might impact a cemetery has to work with SHPO. And guess what? These are private companies that are building on private land. With $34 million of state tax credits but yes. okay but so <laughs> but that yes that that still doesn't count oh i point you to the supreme court <laughs> saying uh hey if you're not giving them money uh-huh. you're not giving them money sure if you're if you're not taking money from them that's not the you same. are not giving them money that's and i'm that's, so state credits you're not giving them saying. money no, i'm just count. saying the supreme court settled it yeah. so that's box number two yeah so they're good okay what's box three <sighs> I'm really, I'm going to forget this one. Uh, the code number? The code number. Not important. I think it's 759. Okay. Um, so this Ohio revised code number seven something, uh-huh. um, it's an interesting one because it says that a municipality can sell land that was previously a cemetery but is now abandoned. Okay. North Market or yep. North Graveyard. Perfect yep. Fits. Um, but... The buyer of that land cannot take possession of it without without removing all of the graves. Okay, and it has this interesting language where it says you have to re- re-erect the any monuments or tombstones found at that location at the location of reburial. Which one would uh, in this case would basically say, "Hey, they're going to Green Lawn, and mm-hmm. that's what we did." Yeah. Okay. Put a pin in that, though. Okay. Um. Under that law... That wasn't city land at that point, was it? It was because it belonged to North Market. Well, it belong, it, sorry, it belongs to the city, not the North Market like d- development I corporation think, or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, but that's still a city Got it. entity, okay. you know, legally. Okay. So, that law, that Ohio state law, does not say anything about SHPO's involvement. And okay. because of that, SHPO's... There are these emails from Lahana Associates and from Rockbridge to Krista Horrocks asking, hey, are we... Can you sign off on this? Right. Are we okay? Are we doing the right okay, thing Okay, because that's, that's what you as a developer, like your reading of the law, what authority can mm-hmm. basically vouch that we did this the right way? Here's our plan. Yeah. And then what did Shippo say? She had to say... You know, I can give you recommendations about what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing, mm-hmm. but we don't have any jurisdiction over this, so okay. I can't tell you if you're if you're following the law or not. Basically, did, and did they point to a jurisdictional authority? As close as I, they did. They said under this under this revised code, we don't have any authority. We don't have any jurisdiction over that law. Who does the municipality? 
Yes. So okay. <laughs> we think. Is that a yes or is that a? Uh? It's a. I don't know. Okay. Be- and 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 this is sort of the question I'm working with now. This is we're up to the limits of my knowledge about how any of this went down. Okay. Um, because the only definitive thing that's in those emails is somebody from Rockbridge said we are in dialogue with the city about this question. Um, Sorry, I'm remembering a very minor point of this. The city didn't sell the land. They, right? The city is le- the city is allowing them to build on the land. So that's that's an intricacy that I may not be. Let's look into that, and okay, I might yeah. be wrong. And the, this again will be in the fact check. But sure. if because what you said, at least what I heard, is the city can sell land. There is no law that I imagine posited a situation where there. Sorry, there should be one because this happens all the time, where the city is like, this is actually still ours. The reason Mm -hmm. why I believe that is because I know there was disagreement about what happens to the parking fees Mm -hmm. for the parking garage that's associated with the Merchant Tower. Okay, so So that is still theirs. Then I would would be interested in the language of the law then, about whether it says sell or whether it says some other word. We'll look at it, yeah. But basically, this was... This was the question they were asking. Is, okay. Are we doing everything right under this specific law? They and went to Shippo. Shippo said, here's recommendations, but, but I, I can't, can't sign off on it. Yeah. So then they went to the city. And as far as I, I don't know who they talked to with the city. Okay. Clearly somebody said, you're good because they're, they're building they're moving the forward. Thing. Yeah. Right. But I don't know who that person was and I don't know how they came to a decision. Well, I that. imagine that the development company is large enough to have lawyers that would say, hey, you you checked every box you could. Yeah. Even if nobody's telling you no. Even if nobody's saying yes, if they're all not telling you no, then you're okay. Right. Right. And it, it kind of came up a few times because remember earlier I said about the, the monuments and the tombstones? Okay. So at one point um, on Spruce Street, Lahana and Associates did discover two footstones. Okay. Um, footstones traditionally would not have the name of the person in the grave that they are marking. Okay. That's important to remember. Usually, if they had any ind- indication or uh, inscription, it would just be the initials of the person. Okay. So there's no way of knowing who these footstones belong to. Mm-hmm. So... Lahan and Associates, when they contacted Shippo, they were saying, hey, and again, they, they were going through the process they were supposed to be going through. They that were they saying, thought they were supposed to be going right, through. They were right. saying, hey, we found these. Um, our plan is to rebury them, not re-erect them the way the law says we, we should be doing because we can't, we don't know who these footstones belong to. So we don't have a, when we rebury this at Greenlawn, we don't have a, a individual we can re-erect them associate with. them yeah. with okay so we consider them artifacts that we should be reburying um but they're and they're giving this to to shippo as like a hey you tell us yeah we don't okay out of we think we're doing the right thing but out of, out an of an abundance, abundance of, of caution, caution right and the answer again is we don't have jurisdiction over that. We can't. Hmm. We can't tell you what to do. I thought so, you were going to go down a route of like state law defines monuments this way. Right. No. No. I right. don't. Yeah. No, so that's another question. But why I, is that? Sorry, I didn't hear in your original telling that the monuments had anything to do with the remains. They. They don't. Well, so these monuments were discovered at a grave location. Right. But it's one of those cross-cutting graves. Um, okay. So it's not clear. But yeah, it's okay. It's an interesting legal thing to think about, yeah, right? But, but it, I think what it shows, though, is that they were, the archaeologists were doing everything they could to keep everything within the bounds of the law. Right. But there's just so many people, like, this is just... Well, and a, to an extent going above and beyond, right? Yeah. The documentation that they're doing, the testing that they're doing, like, they're doing it right as far as we can tell. Yeah. While folks, by and large, may not have been a, as informed as they should have been about... Here's what's going to happen when we do this. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, but the, the problem they keep that everyone involved in this keeps running into is that it's a mess. Mm-hmm. It's just an absolute mess. It's been a mess for 150 years. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I think mostly people are trying to do the right thing. Um, as much as that is a bit of a corporate sort of PR statement. Right. Um, 
but it's hard to do the right thing when something is this messy. Yeah. You know? <laughs> True. Jesse, thanks for your time. Thank you. I'm sorry. I feel like we've, uh, no, we've not gone at all. well over. <laughs> not at all. Thank you for listening to the Confluence Cast presented by Columbus Underground. Again, you can get more information on what we discussed today in the show notes for this episode at theconfluencecast.com. Please rate, subscribe, share this episode of the Confluence Cast with your friends, family, contacts, enemies, your favorite archaeologist. If you're interested in sponsoring the Confluence Cast, get in touch with us. We can be reached by email at info at theconfluencecast.com. Our theme music was composed by Benji Robinson. Our producer is Philip Cogley. I'm your host, Tim Fulton. Have a great week. Thank you.